Mm. So, well, sisters, we're going to look at uh, Daniel chapter 9 together. It is uh, uh, a wonderful prophecy. I'm going to just start with the, the formal uh, announcement so that uh, that can go on to the web. So, I'm Brother Stephen Palmer from Mumbles. Uh, this is the session, Saturday the 30th, 5 p.m., Lockdown Bible School. And the subject is the amazing prophecy, the amazing 70 week prophecy of Daniel 9. It is a, a well studied chapter, but um, for some reason it's seldom used for preaching. And I think there are two reasons for this. One is there's controversy around the chronology, about the dates of the kings of Persia that have to be used to understand when the start point is. And secondly, there are misunderstandings of the text, and particularly amongst the futurist uh, establishment, the way in which they handle Daniel chapter 9 really is very strange indeed, because they take of the 70 weeks, the last week, and they float it more than 2,000 years into the future. And perhaps because controversy surrounds the chapter, it's not perhaps appreciated how amazing and forceful it is. So we're going to have a look at that together. The chapter's in two parts. First of all, there's the prayer that was offered and then interrupted by the coming of Gabriel and the wonderful promises that were prophesied in the second part. We can spend a few minutes looking at the prayer. Okay, so let's look at the first few verses, verses one to three. Of chapter 9 of Daniel. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So Daniel was studying prophecy. As a prophet, he was still fascinated and, and caught up in, in the word of God through Jeremiah, and he understood Jeremiah chapter 25 and Jeremiah chapter 29. So if you just want to turn to Jeremiah chapter 29, you'll see there the second reference to the 70 years of captivity of Babylon. Just want to go to Jeremiah chapter 29. I'll read it from verse 10. Thus saith Yahweh that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you, and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith Yahweh, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall he call upon me, and he shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and he shall seek me and find me, when he shall search for me with all your heart, and I will be found of you, saith Yahweh. Daniel has read this and he's understood that he has to pray in deep sincerity. He has to seek God, as you can see in verse 13, with all his heart. And the language there in Daniel chapter 1 verse 3 picks out the 70 years, the desolations of Jerusalem, which is part of the prophecy. And you can see there in verse 3 of Daniel 9, to seek by prayer. That's exactly what Jeremiah says. But it wasn't an ordinary prayer. You must search for me with all your heart. And this is what the prayer of Daniel does. It's an amazing prayer of intense searching with all the heart. It's in two parts. The first up to verse 15 is the confession, a confession of sin. Daniel confesses the sins of the people and he includes himself, of course, in that. He says in verse 4, I prayed unto Yahweh my God and made my confession. And this confession is very, very uh, honest, isn't it? Verse 5, we have sinned. Uh, verse, 11, uh, verse 8, we have sinned. Verse 11, we have sinned. Verse 15, we have sinned. And in declaring the sin of himself and the nation, he contrasts that with the righteousness of God. God is righteous. Israel is shamefaced. God is righteous because Israel wouldn't listen and God has brought 
about the, the things that he had said he would do. God is, is true to his word. And so there's a confession made that man is sinful and that the Lord is righteous. The second part from verses 16 down to 19 is the petition. What does, what does Daniel want? Well, he wants the promise of Jeremiah chapter 29 to be fulfilled. He wants the desolations of Jerusalem to be removed. He wants God's face to shine upon Jerusalem. And we look very briefly at that. Just notice then in the opening uh, of the prayer, verse 4, what we have there is some expressions which are taken from the book of Deuteronomy. So the great and dreadful God is the, the prayer of Deuteronomy chapter 7. And just go back there very briefly. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, we have that uh, rare expression, the great and terrible. And it's found in verse 21 of Deuteronomy 7. And it describes the God who can be trusted to put, uh, to, to be able to accomplish his, his purposes. The God who is able to bring them into the promised land. And so verse 21 says, Thou shalt not be affrighted at them. For Yahweh thy God is among you, a mighty God and a terrible. God is all powerful. He's a mighty God and a terrible. This is the expression that Daniel takes up. And you can see also that Daniel says that God, it, God is a God who keeps covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. And those are the words of Daniel chapter 7, verse 9, which says, Know therefore that Yahweh thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. And Daniel is one of those later generations who now understands that God is faithful. What he's promised, he will fulfill. He's promised at the end of 70 years, if you search for me with all your heart, I will hear you. And so Daniel tells, goes back in his thoughts to Deuteronomy chapter 7. And what is so lovely about this chapter, which is the start of Daniel's prayer, is in verses 7 and 8 of Deuteronomy chapter 7. And it's about the love of God. Yahweh set his love upon them, the passage says, because Yahweh loved them and would keep the oath which he had sworn. God is a faithful God and he is a God of love and he will keep the promises that he has made. And Daniel begins the prayer in that way. I also want to, to point out that Deuteronomy chapter 9 uh, is brought to mind as well in the words of this wonderful prayer. So in, in Daniel, chapter nine, Daniel chapter 9, verse 7, you see there, Daniel says, O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee. Righteousness belongs unto God, not to us, to God. God is right. God is right in condemning sin. God is right in fulfilling his word. And you see in Deuteronomy chapter 9 how this is brought out. In Deuteronomy chapter 9 at verse 4, it says, When you go into the land, speak not in thine heart after that Yahweh thy God hath cast them out from before you, saying, For my righteousness Yahweh hath brought me in to possess this land. Verse 5, Not for thy righteousness. Verse 6, understand therefore that Yahweh thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness. You see, it wasn't their righteousness, it was God's righteousness. And that's what Daniel appreciates, he understands the deep principle of the atonement, that God might be just and the justifier. And four times in his prayer, he makes that same point, righteousness belongeth unto thee. Our God is righteous for thy righteous, not for our righteousnesses, for thy righteousness sake. Can you see the principles of prayer coming through there? Uh, you know, it's no self-justification. There's no excuses. There's no, no, um, uh, no our but. It's a full confession of sin. And also just one uh, or two more points about the prayer. As you go down from verses 9 to 14 
in Daniel chapter 9, you'll see there at, at least two references to what is written in the law of Moses and several references to we have not obeyed the voice. Now, this is from Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy uh, chapter 4 and 5 is all about obeying the voice. And chapter uh, 4 and 5 of Deuteronomy emphasizes that when they came to Mount Sinai, they heard the voice of the living God and they would hear, they must listen, they must do what that voice says. Otherwise, Deuteronomy says, a curse will come upon them. You see Daniel chapter 9, verse 11. Therefore the curse is poured upon us. And what God has done, it says in verse 12, he hath confirmed his words, which he spake against us. And that's from Deuteronomy 27, verse 26. So these references to the book of Deuteronomy are very powerful and important. And it links up to Jeremiah, because Jeremiah, which is the book that Daniel was reading, probably the Deuteronomy open as well, was all about what God had said in Deuteronomy. It said that if they broke the covenant, that they would be removed from the land. But, but, Deuteronomy chapter 30, if when they were in captivity, they turned to him. If when they were cast out of the land, they returned to him, then he would be found of them. So Daniel is praying in the word of God to, for the faithful God of love to confirm his covenant. Let's look at the petition from verse 16 down to verse 19. We've got the petition and you can see that just highlighted some of the, the references to Jerusalem. So what Daniel is asking for is that the city of Jerusalem, the holy mountain and the sanctuary, there's Jerusalem, there's the Mount Moriah, and there's the temple, now destroyed, desolate, broken down. The city is called by thy name. That's what Daniel's praying for. And it's still about Deuteronomy. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 12, God says that there would be a place where he would put his name, where his name would dwell amongst the people and that was Jerusalem so when I just highlight some of these other words now can you see that it's not just Jerusalem it's not just that Daniel wants to get the capital back let's get back home what Daniel wants is for the place where God said his name would dwell to be once more the place where God's name was manifest Daniel isn't praying for himself. I don't think he, he ever got back there, did he? What Daniel is praying for is for God to be glorified. Can you see that? For the Lord's sake, for thine own sake, that his name might be glorified and manifest in a people who are fitting for that purpose. And you can see now, when you come to Daniel chapter 9 and verse, verse 17, 18 and 19, the reference to God causing his face to shine upon the city and upon the people that are called by thy name. And this, this is a, a, a reference back to Numbers chapter 6 and the great blessing. Do you remember the blessing in Numbers chapter 6? Verse 23 says, Speak unto Aaron and unto his sons, saying, On this wise he shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, Yahweh bless thee and keep thee. Yahweh make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel and I will bless them. They shall put my name upon the children of Israel. So, so the children of Israel are invested with God's name. They have become adopted uh, children of God, the, the name of God. They've been brought into the family of God. And we, we're told by brethren who know Hebrew that the sense in verses 18 and 19 
of the city which is called by thy name and the people that are called by thy name is not really that at all. It's the city and the people upon whom the name has been called. Right? So it's about that name being uh, called upon the people. And so what is this prayer about? Well, what Daniel has expounded for us is the great principles of the atonement and God's purpose. This isn't just a simple, I was wrong, or I'm sorry I was wrong, or I wish I hadn't done it, I'm sorry I was wrong. This, this is a, a, a scriptural inspired prayer, confessing the sins of not just others, but himself, and declaring God to be righteous, that he might be just. And then aligning the petition, what you want then, aligning that petition with the purpose of God to pray as we would for God's kingdom to come, for his name to be glorified, for the earth to be full of his glory and to align our thoughts and our aspirations and our hopes to that great purpose into which we have been baptized, into the name, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, with the Father's name written on the forehead. This is what this prayer does. And you can see when you realize just what a, uh, a majestic prayer it is, why this answer was so appropriate, why Daniel was greatly beloved, why it was he that uh, was given the promise of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's move on then to that second part from Daniel chapter 9 and verse 20. It says, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before Yahweh my God, for the holy mountain of my God, yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening ablation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplication, the commandment came forth. And I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. It's a remarkable thing, you know, that a confession of sin makes a man greatly beloved. But that's true, isn't it? You know, as, as David confesses his sin, God's love is manifest and shown to him in the forgiveness of sins. So what now Daniel is told by the angel is that there is going to be a period of 70 weeks upon the people and the city. Daniel's been praying for the people and he's been praying for the holy city. He's been asking that God's name would be called upon them. And by the way, just to go back to, to the prayer, you notice uh, if you're reading the authorised version, you'll see that the word Lord is almost always in lower case, right? So it's not the word Yahweh most times. There are some occurrences of Yahweh, uh, but mainly it's the word Lord. And if you notice, when Daniel speaks to God, he does not use the name. He uses Lord. When he's speaking of God, then we have the few occurrences where Yahweh is spoken of, when he's, I think, quoting scripture. But when he is speaking himself, he doesn't call upon the name. And that's because he's praying that it might once again come upon the people. It's as, as it were being suspended. They are now outside of the embrace of that name. And the answer really is not until the Lord Jesus Christ comes is the manifestation of the love of God uh, embraced in that name going to be manifest in the uh, answer to Daniel's prayer, which is the removal of sin. So you notice then in verse 24, there are six things stated, two sets of three, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity. And you can see that 
Uh, the second three, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So those three things, they, they uh, form an ABC, ABC pattern. They're in step parallelism, uh, I believe, and I'll just explain that now. So what are those three things about? Well, the first thing is to finish the transgression. And when the Lord Jesus Christ came, the nation of Israel did fill up the measure of the iniquity of their fathers. They, they filled it up to the brim. Uh, and their, uh, you know, the way they dealt with the prophets, the way that they had rejected the word of God, reached its final fullness in the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and the Lord makes reference to that, doesn't he? in Matthew chapter 23, fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ would make an end of sins. It would make an end of sins, not just um, through bringing forgiveness, but he would make an end of sin offerings. He would render them all now of no point because he was the once for all sacrifice to end all sins. He was the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. And by doing so, make reconciliation for iniquity. He would be the atonement for iniquity. He would make us reconciled to God. And the marvelous thing there in those three statements is you have the threefold manifestation of sin, transgression, sins, and iniquities. Those embrace the, the totality of sinfulness. And it is, uh, the three words are used on the great day of atonement, aren't they? When all the transgressions, sins and iniquities of Israel were taken away. That's what Daniel chapter 9 is telling us. Daniel answers, bring us back into fellowship. Take away us, we have sinned. Show your forgivenesses and your mercy. And the answer was, in a certain amount of time, one will come to finish all the transgressions of the nation, to make an end of those sin offerings and to take sin away and thereby open the way for reconciliation to God. Put in a positive statement, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision, to confirm the vision. All the promises of God are in him, yea and amen. And to anoint the most holy, the Lord Jesus Christ is the most holy one. And he was anointed, wasn't he? Acts chapter 4 verse 27 speaks of the holy child Jesus whom thou hast anointed. Acts chapter 10 verse 38 speaks of how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. And the Lord Jesus in, in an immortal state, anointed with spirit, uh, without measure, and a change of nature has gone into the most holy, into the very presence of God to be the great high priest for us. So in, I suppose, in cryptic terms, what Daniel has been told is, the time's going to come, Daniel, when your prayer really is going to be answered. Well, I'm going to take away all the sins, iniquities and transgressions of the people, and I'm going to bring in everlasting righteousness as the prophecies have foretold as the types and shadows of the law have indicated. And I'm going to bring mine anointed into the most holy place as a sacrifice and uh, an incense offering that will bring reconciliation to the people. But when would it happen? And this is where uh, people, I think, get, get uh, difficulty. I think we need to look at it uh, carefully. So first uh, 25 tells us that those 70 weeks, 70 weeks of years, obviously, um, begin with a commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. So we know when it's going to start. It's going to start with a commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. And you'll see there, that it's divided, that time period is divided up into three parts. There's a seven weeks, there's a 62 weeks, and then there's a final week. 
And in, in verse 25, you've got, uh, it says, No, therefore understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and to build Jerusalem and to Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks. And three is gone two weeks. Then it breaks. It doesn't say about the final week. It just says after uh, 62 weeks, it says, The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after 62 weeks shall Messiah be cut off. So just set them out like this, right? What's happening is that we've been taken through the sequence of the first two periods twice. There's going to be seven weeks and then 62 weeks. Right, let's deal with the seven weeks. What's going to happen there? Well, the street will be built again and the wall even in troublous times. In other words, the first seven weeks, the first 49 year period from the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem will be a period of trouble. They're going to build Jerusalem since the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, but there's going to be opposition. There are going to be difficulties. There are going to be uh, real, real problems, but the wall and Jerusalem is going to be built. That takes us up probably to the time of Malachi. And then there's going to be a 62 week period, the 434 years between the Testaments, where, as far as scripture is concerned, nothing really happens, does it? And so we're not interested in what happens in those 62 weeks. We're just treading water until the time goes by. But after that's those 62 weeks, then Messiah's got to be cut off. Not only that, notice there's two things that are going to happen after the 62 weeks. Messiah's got to be cut off, but not for himself. That's the first thing. But then the second thing, and the people of the prince, Messiah is the prince, the people of the prince, that is his armies, shall come and shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. So there's two things going to happen after that 62-week period. Messiah is going to be cut off. Of course, that's the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not for himself. Uh, he, he gained uh, no kingdom from that point of view, did he? Um, you know, he didn't. Uh, he wasn't cut off in order to take the kingdom there and then. There was going to be a period of time. Uh, Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. The, the temple was going to be destroyed. But of course, neither of those things uh, have to happen immediately after, you know, the first day after the 62 weeks. This is, I think, where people get a bit confused. See, what's happening is there's a seven week period, then there's a 62 week period. Now, after this 62 week period, Messiah is going to be cut off. Well, how long after? Well, the text goes on to tell us how long after. What? So there's verse 26 that we read. Messiah shall be cut off, first point, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's the second thing. The verse 27 takes us through those two things. When will Messiah be cut off? Well, this is where the final week comes in. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. The death, the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, when, when the, the temple veil was rent from top to bottom, signaled the end of all other sacrifices were but the shadows and types of the true sacrifice, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was in the middle, in the midst is the middle, the middle of the week. And then after that, you have this destruction uh, brought about. So we'll come back to this. The people of the prince shall come, those the Romans, and they were the overspreading of abominations that made desolate, but they themselves would be desolated eventually. How does this work out then chronologically? Well, 
when would you start the command to rebuild Jerusalem? There are four possible dates that people have suggested. There they are, Cyrus, uh, Darius, and, and two for Artaxerxes. And the first two just don't work. The Nehemiah one is the one that uh, has often been used, but I'm afraid to get the Nehemiah date, you have to develop your own Persian chronology, which seems to me to be a difficult thing to justify. But there is a, a, a prophecy, or a, a starting point, which I think ticks all the boxes in Ezra chapter 7 and 9. It's hidden away a bit, but it is the case that in the seventh year of Artaxerxes, and we know that because we're told uh, in chapter uh, 7 of Ezra, verses 7 and 8, that Ezra went by decree of the king in the seventh year of Artaxerxes, and that decree gave him the command to repair the desolations and to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. So it was, it was a command to restore and to build Jerusalem. Artaxerxes gave Nehemiah a similar injunction. And so I suppose we've got two possible dates, the seventh year of Artaxerxes or the 20th year of Artaxerxes. What dates for that? Artaxerxes, we're told, reigned, and I'm just taking standard chronology, nothing, nothing uh, personal about this has just come out of the, uh, the, the textbooks. Um, the reign of Artaxerxes was 465, or was it 464? And this is one of the things you get in uh, these, these uh, tomes. And it seems that Artaxerxes came to the throne in 465, but if you start his reign from the new year after he took the throne, which is the regnal year, if you, if you say, no, I know, he, I know he became king in 465, but he's not officially uh, until his coronation on the new year, which is 464. That's why you get, well, was it 465 or was it 464? And most people say it was 465 because they're not saying when he actually started. They're saying it was the new year after he started. But I just mentioned that. But if you look at this, the ESV Study Bible actually, and I'm going to go with this one, the ESV Study Bible says that Ezra departed from Babylon in the year 45. Eight. So I'm going to take that as our starting year. And if you take then 458 and you add the numbers, the last week, the last seven years of Daniel chapter 9's prophecy is AD 26. The middle of the week is when Jesus was to make an end of sacrifice. In other words, the crucifixion. The date, AD 20, 30, AD 29, AD 30. Okay, if you say, I, I don't want 458, I want 457. Okay, we'll just add a year on. In other words, just take in standard chronology, Daniel chapter 9 predicts the crucifixion at the year AD 30. 500 years before it happened, the year of the crucifixion was predicted. When was the crucifixion? When was it? Well, let's just ask Wikipedia. And Wikipedia quite helpfully says, well, you know, it has to be within the reign of, or the governorship of Pontius Pilate, which was AD 26 to AD 36. Our date is bang in the middle of that. And if that's all you could say, that would be remarkable enough, wasn't it? Yeah. To get the date of the crucifixion to within plus or minus five years, wouldn't that be an amazing thing? You know, if any human being could, could predict something like that, I mean, well, it's beyond belief. And yet, 
quite apart. I mean, the scholars aren't looking at Daniel chapter 9. They're looking at other history and, and other chronology. Look what it says. The 14th of Nisan of the year AD 30 is apparently, in the opinion of the majority of contemporary scholars as well, far and away the most likely date of the crucifixion of Jesus. Oh, I just think that's a stunning thing. Separately, that Jesus was crucified AD 30. Daniel says, well, Daniel's told, that's when Messiah is going to be cut off. Don't you think that's an amazing thing? You think, well, why, why, aren't we, why don't we use that to prove fulfilled the Bible prophecy? Why? Well, because it's surrounded by controversy. Because one of the things is, well, look, it says that after uh, the 70 weeks, then Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. And it wasn't destroyed till AD 70. How do you explain that? And it also says, well, what happened in AD 33? Nothing, did it? You know, so why? why? Uh, and the answer, I think, is in Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3. There were people who says, prophecy is not going to be fulfilled. Where is the promise of his coming? It's, it hasn't happened. AD 33 is long gone. And Peter says, it's the long suffering of God is waiting. They didn't know it was 8070. There was no date to say it's going to be 8070. It was the long suffering of God giving them time to repent. Eventually they ran out of time. But did anything significant happen in 8033? Well, one thing you need to notice is what's supposed to happen in the last week. Verse 27 of Daniel 9 says, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. So what's to happen is that in the first three and a half years of that last week, that is the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ from you know, his baptism up until his crucifixion, those three and a half years, he confirmed the covenant. He taught the truth, the gospel, and he confirmed it in his own blood. The three and a half years following was a period when that covenant was confirmed through the preaching of the apostles. But why stop at AD 33? Why stop? Didn't the apostles' work go way beyond that? And I think this is uh, something to look at now. The word for confirm in the covenant is... Not the ordinary word for confirm, but it is a word which is translated strengthen or prevail. The covenant is going to prevail. It's going to overcome. It's going to be strong. And that is something that we need to look at. So two, uh, two possible events in the Acts of the Apostles would fit around this time of AD 33-34. Stephen is death in Acts chapter 7 and Cornelius is baptism in Acts chapter 10. And a case can be made for Cornelius and I don't want to uh, diminish uh, the points that are made there but what I'd want to suggest to you is that the death of Stephen fits beautifully with the 70 big prophecy. When you come to Acts chapter uh, six, you'll see there um, some of the points. But bef before we, we do that, can we date uh, Stephen uh, or Cornelius? And the answer is we can't date Cornelius, but we can get close to dating Stephen. And we can do this uh, in a backwards way because the chronology of the Apostle Paul can be, can be uh, developed very, very precisely. If anybody wants, uh, I've got a chart uh, summarising the evidence. It's just part of it. If anybody wants that, just drop me a line and I'll, and I'll share that with you. But you can, and I'm just going to cut to the chase here, you can actually work out that the Apostle Paul, as Saul of Tarsus, would have been baptised round about AD 33, 34. Yeah, that's surprising, isn't it? That early. 
only three or four years after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the conversion or uh, the death of Stephen must have been before that, but not long before that, because you've got to have Acts chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, and chapter 5 all unfolding. And it, it reads perhaps as, it, you know, it's not a matter of weeks or even months, a period of time for the Ecclesia to develop uh, and so on. So I would say that the, the death of Stephen was pretty close to AD 33 uh, because it would be just before the baptism of Saul. In other words, Saul with his conscience seared by what had happened uh, to, to Stephen, though he is trying to suppress that conscience and trying to uh, get rid of this threat to, to you know, the, the traditions of Judaism. Uh, finds that on the road to Damascus, the Lord appears to him. Well, did Stephen represent the work of confirming the covenant? And you see in Acts chapter 6, verse 8, uh, yes, it says, Stephen, full of faith and power, with great, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Great faith and power, great wonders he certainly strengthened the covenant he certainly demonstrated in a dramatically powerful way uh, the, the resurrection of the lord jesus christ and the new covenant which had been brought in through the uh, death and resurrection of the lord you also notice in chapter 6 verse 10 it says they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake they were not able to resist. He prevailed over them. The, the, the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake right, was, was a prevailing power over the arguments of the enemy. He confirmed the covenant. They accused him of speaking against Moses and the law and the temple. Well, these are the very things that Daniel was referring to. Daniel was confessing that they had broken the covenant. Daniel was confessing that they'd broken, uh, they had listened to the words of Moses. And that's why they, they were in the condition they were. And now that iniquity was being filled up. And Acts chapter 7 shows that uh, uh, through, through inspiration, Stephen uh, understood that the iniquity was now come to the full. And echoing the words of the Lord Jesus Christ and the words of Daniel chapter 9, he says, verse 51, stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and years, he do always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do ye. So, I'm not dismissing the link with Cornelius because, you know, both of them saw the heavens open. There's a strong link between Stephen and Cornelius. And uh, for another day, it goes back to Isaiah 64 to 66. Um, and I just mentioned this now, that Isaiah 64 to 66 has to do with AD 70 and the destruction of Jerusalem, as well as the promises. And so the final thing that Daniel says is that the overspreading of abomination shall make desolate. And Josephus tells us that the Romans came and they made desolate the country, it was in AD 70. They destroyed the city, they destroyed the temple. The evidence of the existence of that temple is visible today. But before we finish, just let me make a couple of points. I believe, and I tried to make the case, that this prophecy is an amazing fulfillment and proof of inspiration of scripture. Just absolutely stunning. You know, to get, and of course, there's, there's always doubt around the starting dates because secular history is just not as well uh, grounded as people often assume. You see a number in a book, you think, well, that must be right. But then you go into, well, how do you know? How can you be sure? Uh, you think, well, hmm, why not? But just taking the consensus view, you come to the consensus year of the crucifixion. Isn't that amazing? Well, many of Daniel's prophecies have had amazing fulfillments, but the skeptic says, <laughs> yes, but they were written after the event, weren't they? Well, not this one. 
Whenever you think Daniel was written, it was written before the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, even if it had been uh, written 10 years before, you would have thought it amazing to get the year right. 50 years before, well, pretty unbelievable. 100 years before, oh, spooky. Hundreds of years before, how do we know when Daniel was written? Well, at least we know the Dead Sea Scrolls have extracts of Daniel. And also, and I didn't know this till I checked, that Daniel is quoted in sections of other literature, the Sibylline Oracles, dated to the second century BC. So Daniel was written hundreds, well, we know when it was written, but you know, as far as the scholars are concerned, it was written at least a couple of hundred years before the events that have now been uh, predicted and shown to come true in a remarkable way. Josephus gives us a remarkable, a remarkable testimony to the argument that we should be able to make. Josephus writing at the time of the fulfillment of the final fulfillment of the 70 weeks prophecy when, when the Romans came uh, with their eagle banners and they desecrated the temple and they uh, set up that uh, abomination and they trampled it down and they themselves eventually will be judged for that. But what, that, what Josephus says is, and he, he understood, look, from them we believe that Daniel conversed with God for he did not only prophesy of future events as did the other prophets but he also determined the time of their accomplishment. And then Josephus goes on to say something which is, I found, a remarkable point. He said, God honoured Daniel and may thence discover how the Epicureans are in an error. Wow, well, why does he bring in Epicureans? Remember who the Epicureans were. The Epicureans were a group of philosophers in Athens that the Apostle Paul debated with. The Epicureans were evolutionists. The Epicureans are humanists. The Epicureans have their counterpart today in those who, who promote evolution and who promote atheism, who pr promote the humanistic uh, worldview which dominates today. That is an Epicurean phenomenon. Now, Josephus could understand that Daniel was an answer to Epicurean skepticism. He describes the Epicureans in this way. He says, they are in error who cast providence out of human life and do not believe that God takes care of the affairs of the world. Then he says, so that by the forementioned predictions of Daniel, those men seem to me very much to err from the truth, who determine that God exercises no providence over human affairs. For if that were the case, that the world went on by mechanical necessity, we should not see all things would come to pass according to this prophecy. It's not amazing how he got the point. And I do believe, and sisters, that point is still valid, that the, this amazing prophecy of, of Daniel chapter 9 is a proof of the inspiration of Scripture. Daniel couldn't possibly have known, couldn't possibly have known any of those things that are revealed. But when we look back, we see that the Lord Jesus Christ came in due time, at the right time, the time fulfilling God's time scale. And he came to make an end of sin and bring in everlasting righteousness. And that prophecy has been made safe and come down to us through the providence of God in the wonderful word of scripture to give us hope and encouragement in these last days that we do not give in to the spirit of the age but that we see not just this prophecy but all the other prophecies of scripture and the book of revelation unfolding so dramatically with such pace now that we believe the day is soon to come when the lord jesus christ will be here and daniel and the faithful of all ages will be awakened from the sleep of death and they will hear that wonderful word that Daniel anticipated in chapter 10. Be strong. Be strong. Let us therefore, brothers and sisters, young people, be strong in the faith and thank Daniel and the word of God.
that we have such wonderful evidence. 